All right. I think we are a live video starting right now. And uh, I'm Joe Terosi, and this is the Burbank Faith uh, Sermonette. And uh, it's funny, I still see we're buffering before I get on. So I don't know. I'm assuming I'm on. I guess I'm on. So I'm Joe Terosi, and pastor of Burbank Faith Church. And this is our Wednesday Sermonette, which, <coughs> excuse me, which is coming to you early. Uh, just busy day, a lot of stuff going on. And uh, I just needed to get this out and get it out without being rushed. Uh, just want to get through this. I don't want to go too long, too deep, um, but but get through it. We were going to talk about Stephen and uh, Acts chapter 6 tonight and the calling of Stephen and the stewards. And uh, it's a great passage. Of course, we all know what ends up with uh, happening to Stephen, but we also meet Philip on that journey. Uh, but uh, the things that happened this week kind of uh, took precedent over it. And, and uh, I'm going to talk about John Gruden a little bit tonight. And John Gruden's the coach of the Raiders. He was no longer the coach of the Raiders. Got busted for emails that uh, he shouldn't have uh, sent uh, over 10 years ago in some cases. And uh, it makes you wonder all the other stuff that, that went on with it and why him and who else's emails are safe. But I'm not really going to talk about that. But I'm going to talk about Gruden and I'm going to talk about the triumph of the church. So we're going to be in Colossians uh, chapter 1. 13 through 14, Colossians chapter one, sometimes called collisions by young people, uh, but Colossians chapter one, verses 13 through 14. And uh, if you're on and you're clicking on, I can't see you because in this format, when I'm sitting down, I can't see when people uh, come on board. Uh, so forgive me if I haven't acknowledged you, um, but there's uh, Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Philippians and Colossians, and that's where we are, Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, and we'll be back in Acts next week. And the text says, picking up at verse 13, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed unto us the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Lord, in these next few minutes, Lord, let it be your wisdom, not my wisdom, your truth, not my theology, your spirit, not my ego. Lord, give us all soft hearts and open ears to what you have to share with each one of us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let me read that one more time. This is Paul to the church in Coloss. He says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption through His blood and the forgiveness of sins. Amen. I can end right there. And nothing I'm going to say after this is going to be better than that. Uh, but it is encouraging. So, John Gruden resigned, removed, or was fired as head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders this week. And I'm not here to talk about sports, and I'm not here to talk about whether he should have been fired or not. Um, at the very least, Gruden should have practiced some wisdom, checked his vanity, and surveyed that even 10 years ago, our world was changing, and that nothing is um, going to go under the rug ever, uh, especially if somebody has a grievance and... and uh, our world is all about grievance and litigiousness, and, uh, and so, uh, so yeah, it's there. So he should have practiced some wisdom. But here's the thing. As I watched the reactions to Gruden about what took place, I marveled how Gruden became this bone to be chewed by anyone and everyone, like the fish that, uh, oh, what's the name of the character, an old man in the sea? You know, he catches the, the, the fish and he's got it last, lashed to the side of his boat, but the sharks keep eating it and eating it. And, and that really felt like Gruden uh, in the news circle, uh, in the news uh, cycle this week. He was lashed to the side of a boat and the sharks just kept in coming and getting bite after bite after bite. Um, and as I watched it, um, and as it continued, uh, it was a weird thing that happened. My faith, which is the passion of my life, I love sports, love my family, love all that stuff, but the passion of my life, the thing that keeps me going, uh, my faith grew stronger as I watched this, and I was reaffirmed that what I believe is true, and we'll uh, fill this out as the, the message goes on. Today, many would identify the church as being very much like the Pharisees, right? We're very Pharisaic. And everyone loves to say that. We're judgmental. We're this, we're that. We're just like the Pharisees. Everyone throws the Pharisees out there, the Pharisees, the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were full of themselves. And the Pharisees were prideful. Um, even as they acknowledge the scriptures and Jesus, I don't think it happens as much as people think in the church today. Uh, that we, we aren't as Pharisaic as we're like we're portrayed to be. Um, that's just old narrative, sloppy 
uh, sloppy narrative building uh, because we like to paint the church in the corner. The culture likes to paint the church in the corner. Um, certain corners of, of the church like to paint the church in the corner as being very Pharisaic. Um, but okay, let's just say it's true, whatever. But we do know who the Sadducees are, okay? You know, going through Acts, we've learned that there's the Pharisees who believed in the scriptures, who believed in the resurrection, who believed in angels and demons and the afterlife. But then there's the Sadducees, the ones who danced with the Romans the most. And um, they were the ones who didn't believe in angels, demons, and afterlife over a resurrection or in the resurrection. And so, so we've got the church is okay, very Pharisaic, but the, the Sadducees of our present day culture is the media. And the Sadduceic media has had a field day with John Gruden. They have labeled him tried and convicted as sexist, racist, and homophobic, and Gruden didn't help his cause. The only thing I haven't heard about Gruden this week was that he was caught for chewing gum in class or in line in 1976, but I'm sure that will be revealed. And everyone in the sports media is practicing what I call the Stuart Maxim, which is declaring their pain and outrage to be greater than ours, yours, or mine. You know, they feel things deeper. They feel things on a more important level. And you see one ex-athlete or you see one sports announcer, everyone's feeling it more. And especially the white guys. The white guys are really outraged, right? And uh, because we got to show how outraged we are. And uh, it's the Stuart maxim. Um, it's, it's, I got to feel, be more deeper, be more emotional, uh, feel it on a more visceral level or ephemeral. I have to feel it more than you. So I'm going to prove it to you by my outrage and my passion and my tears. Um, and honestly, how much courage does it take to, to write a column about John Gruden today? It's a fish in a barrel. Now he put himself in the barrel, but it's so easy. It doesn't mean anything. And personally, when I see people demonstrating and talk about their feelings, I am as jaded as anybody on the planet. I believe it's all virtue signaling. It's all to demonstrate to the world how much they care. Doesn't absolve Gruden, but this is what we're seeing by the Sadduceic media. And as all this was breaking out Monday night, middle of the football game, my phone started blowing up. And I don't look at my phone texts because I'm usually about an hour behind. By the time I'm done in my office, I'm about an hour behind when a game or a football game starts. But as all this was breaking out on Monday, uh, and then I finally saw what the issue was all about, I knew the sermonette was changing for today, as, especially as I was watching the game and I finally caught up to the section where the news had broke about Gruden's resignation, firing, or removal. Uh, one of the announcers said this about Gruden, and it just, it just confirmed to me everything that, that, that I had already believed, but this is what the media said. This person in the media said, and I don't know this person, what he would claim about his faith or whatever he has any faith or not, but this is what that person said. He said, what Gruden did was unforgivable and he should never be forgiven. Think about that. And I don't think this person in the media was directly affected by what Gruden said, his sexist, racist, homophobic uh, uh, statements and a 10-year-old email and 10-year-old emails and discussions. Um, what he did was unforgivable, said the announcer, and he should never be forgiven. I don't think he killed anybody. He hurt some feelings, but he should never be forgiven. And in that moment, you're not going to believe it, but my heart went out to John Gruden. He kind of moved into my prayer life because I don't know his spiritual condition, but what must it be like to believe you can never be forgiven. What must it be like to live a life where there are people in the world who have uh, done nothing to you personally that you could never find the capacity to forgive? Uh, in that next moment, as I was feeling compassion for John Gruden when I wasn't supposed to be feeling compassion for John Gruden, in the next moment, my heart went to the next place. And that was the triumph of the church. And for those of us who practice a believing loyalty in Jesus Christ, how many of us have bought the farm with a royal screw up? How many of us have uh, done something so egregious that we thought we could never be restored? How many of us for even the briefest of moments would have preferred death than to go on living in the disaster our life had become? We've all been there at some point. We've all had those moments at different stages in life. Um, it, it reminded me of um, the story of Lazarus and uh, how Jesus uh, resurrected Lazarus. But when I read that story of Lazarus, I look at it at another level, not a physical resurrection, 
but I look at it as a, as a, as a spiritual, emotional resurrection. And Jesus resurrects us with his forgiveness. It's as if spiritually we were Lazarus. Uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. <sighs> I don't need the game announcer. I don't need the sports media. I don't need the culture. Jesus is told that Lazarus has been sealed in the tomb for about four days. He's starting to smell. He's starting to rot. And then in verse 40 of chapter 11 of the Gospel of John, he says, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? In verse 43, when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. To the glory of God. In our great anguish, were we not physically dead? Um, you know, we weren't physically dead. Neither is John Gruden, but haven't we all been a place where we were mostly dead? And Jesus says, come out. The creator of all things says, come out to the glory of God, that there is forgiveness. The media, the culture, the Sadducees can never call us back to life. They can't restore us back to hope, but the church practicing and abiding in the gospel of Jesus Christ can restore us all to the land of the living, to the glory of God. Amen. What a victory for us. And that victory is the death knell for those who dismiss, dis diminish, or disregard the power of Jesus and his resurrection. This is our hope. Hebrews 8, 12 says, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. As far as the east is from the west, Psalm 103, 12 says, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I, even I, Isaiah 43, 25, the Lord is speaking, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Amen, hallelujah, to the glory of God. The world is awful apart from the gospel. It offers no hope nor forgiveness. But Christ gives us forgiveness. Christ gives us hope. The Sadducees can say what they want. The media can say what they want. The Pharisees can be what they want. But in Christ, we have forgiveness. We have hope. And we need to recognize that because we were all, whether it's at an equal level or not, we, we all measure our failures and successes as the most catastrophic things in the world, right? Uh, no one's failed like we failed. We know what our internal monologue says to us, and sometimes it's uh, God convicting, and sometimes it's the devil coming to destroy. But we know what our internal monologue is in terms of what we've done and how we failed. We know those things. And so, so the world is awful, and apart from the gospel, it offers no hope nor forgiveness. And I'm going to throw something else on this. Here is something else the world, void of forgiveness, builds on. Okay, you are dismissed, you are canceled, you are removed, you shouldn't be forgiven, and nor should you ever be. Think about this it's Halloween season right now, right? And there's a lot of talk always about you know the scary stuff and the demonic. And when we talk about demonic, we, we which ca it causes us to think of Linda Blair spinning heads and pea soup. But the demonic is about despair, it's about despair, it's about dragging us down. When our failures are so great, so cataclysmic, so horrific, and there's no hope for forgiveness or restoration, think of John Gruden, when there is no hope, the demonic comes in, not with possession and spinning heads and pea soup, but with the despair that drives us further into the ground and deeper into the realm of the dead and our self-destruction ensues. So not only does the world destroy us physically, you'll never be forgiven. We're canceling you, just go away and die. But it also opens the door, if we're not prepared, for the enemy to come in and destroy us even further, spiritually. So we're destroyed physically, emotionally, and spiritually. But this is where the church practicing again a believing loyalty in Jesus Christ, not in its good works, not in its programs, not in its high thinking thinkers, not in anything else, but the book, the blood, and the blessed hope of Christ's resurrection. Those that practice a believing loyalty in Jesus Christ, churches who practice a believing loyalty in Jesus Christ, this is where the church is victorious over the world. When our failures offer no hope, the church, by the blood of Jesus, 
offers redemption and resurrection and a return to the land of the living, all to the glory of God. Amen? Because we have an amazing God, and that is our mission, to rescue people from the dominion of darkness. I don't know Gruden's faith, but boy, I wish I had him, and I'd want to know where he's at spiritually, because this is a message the world needs to know. Not that the church is judgmental, not that the church is what the world describes it as. Remember, the world is always painting the picture for the church, and the church in its weakness accepts the painting of the world, of the church, uh, by the world. We don't, you know, we're going to determine the narrative, and the narrative is we have a practicing and believing loyalty in Jesus Christ, and that message is a message the world needs to know. So if the world moves off of you, if the moral world cancels you, if the world says you could have no forgiveness, ah, we let, me, let us tell you about this amazing God that you need to know about. Some would say, oh, so that's the kind of person you hypocrites in the church would want in. And I say, yeah, because I'm in the church and I was in despair and I was lost and I was an epic failure. I can relate. I think we all can. But here's the good news. Daniel 9, 9 says, the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving even though we have rebelled against him. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us all from unrighteousness. If John Gruden came to my church, we would do what Burbank Faith always does. We'd love him because that's what Burbank Faith and any other church following Christ does. Will I put, my, put him on my church board? No, I won't put him on my church board. Will I put him in my pulpit? No. Will I bring him into membership? No, not right now. My goal is to bring him into the kingdom of God, which is far more important than membership in the church of the Nazarene. My aim for someone like Gruden or for anybody who has committed some cataclysmic failure, some egregious error, some terrible sin, my aim would be to get them to practice repentance, confessing their sins to the Lord. And repentance again, folks, means turning the other way going back in the opposite direction from which you were going, putting the world behind you and the cross before you, as Gaither saying. I would get them to practice repentance, and I would get Gruden, Gruden to practice repentance for whatever he knows he's done and to turn away from it and turn to the one who says in Ephesians 1, 7, and 8, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. And then in Hebrews 17, he adds, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. Why would I want to bow to the throne of the world when I can bow to the throne of Jesus Christ and have my sins remembered no more? He is the one that I'm obedient to. He is the one that I am faithful to. So I wanted to get that across and uh, thanks for clicking on, folks. Um, I did get a message from Jenna Griffin today, and she's part of our Burbank Faith virtual family. And Jenna shared with me that her nephew, his name's Drew, that when they ran the test, because they were looking for lung cancer, his lungs were clear of lung cancer. Now, he's still very sick, but they didn't find any cancer. Amen? Power of prayer, as Jenna said, and that's power of prayer as we know it. So um, praise God for that. And can I encourage you to uh, hit like, 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 share, 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 give us some emojis, give us some comments, give us some things that'll get us back in the, how we would say the, um, what is it, the um, algorithm of, of Facebook. And I'll be posting this to our website later. Sorry if I missed you so early, but thank you for clicking on. And just remember, as the world condemns, as the world destroys, we're the ones that bring the hope to the world. As Thunderclap Newman sang a long time ago, the revolution's here. And that we're the ones who are bringing this revolution. And this revolution is Jesus, Jesus crucified in that empty tomb, which provides the forgiveness that restores us to the land of the living, all for the glory of God. Amen. And to the blessing of our lives. So thank you so much for clicking on. Lord, bless these folks. Bless those that any of us, Lord, that have gone through those moments, Lord, but give us that testimony again, that that be on our lips, how you brought us back to the land of the living. And Lord, we pray for someone like John Gruden tonight. We pray that they can be restored, Lord. Um, who cares about the world's eyes, but that we be restored in your eyes. 
Lord, let us not take too, too, too much to the heart what the world says about us, but let us um, take to heart the praise of your spirit and the praise of you, uh, that that is our desire, that we would hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, folks, God bless, take care, and uh, we will uh, see you soon.